My name is Stephanie Toddy, and I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar today entitled Uprooting STEM Classes, a Flipped Out Class, Data-Driven Decisions and Lessons Learned, presented by Dr. Rob Petros, Assistant Professor, University of North Texas. Dr. Petros is an assistant professor of chemistry at the University of North Texas. He has five years of experience in teaching lower level organic chemistry in sections of 150 plus students per semester. A veteran of the flipped classroom model, Dr. Petros has two years of experience in measuring student outcome attainment and he has created 252 podcasts covering the entire year of subject material for the course. Dr. Petros was uh, designated a next-gen faculty fellow and global learning faculty for UNT's Transform Transformative Instruction Initiative. His research interests are in the area of targeted drug delivery with an ongoing collaboration with the Baylor Charles A. Salmon C Cancer Center in Dallas, Texas. Before we begin today's uh, presentation, just a couple of housekeeping items. If you have specific questions, uh, we encourage everyone to type them through the questions feature of the uh, GoToWebinar control panel, which should be on the right-hand side of your screen at any time throughout the presentation. We will have a chance to answer all questions at the conclusion of the webinar. Also at the conclusion of the webinar, you should have a quick survey pop up for you. We encourage everyone to fill this short survey out if possible so we can continue to provide relevant content in all of our presentations. Also, just as a heads up, we will have um, several short quick bite webinars occurring the week of May the 19th. Each 15 minute presentation will cover topics such as using embedded assessment and creating a category structure within, writing sound questions or sound exam questions, and using exam data for student remediation. For more information or to register, please make sure you visit learn.examsoft.com and then click on the resources tab. And yes, just because I know we'll have several people ask the question, today's webinar is being recorded. All attendees and registrants will receive a follow-up email with the link to the recording in the next couple of days. Once you receive it, please feel free to share it among your peers as you would like. With that, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Rob. Thank you so much for attending. Please enjoy the, the presentation. Well, thank you very much, Stephanie, for that introduction. And I wanted to thank uh, all the people at ExamSoft for arranging and hosting this webinar. Uh, I'm always excited to talk about ways to improve uh, student learning. Uh, I thought I would start by telling you a little bit about my background. Uh, I did my doctoral studies at Columbia University, working with Jack Norton on synthetic and mechanistic organometallic chemistry, and more specifically, asymmetric catalysis. Uh, I then went on to do a postdoc in Joe G. Simone's lab in North Carolina in the NCI Center for Cancer Nanotechnology Excellence, where I worked in the field of targeted drug delivery uh, for treating cancer. And I continue to work in this field and have a collaboration with Baylor Hospital here in Dallas. Uh, so I must admit that I'm a, I'm a researcher first and a teacher second. However, I've taken the call from NSF and others for more teacher scholars to heart. Uh, and the thing that, I, that has really appealed to me about the redesign of my course is the fact that I've been able to generate uh, data that I can use in evaluating the effectiveness of the redesign and improving student attainment. Uh, so in this respect, uh, this work uh, satisfies the researcher side of my personality. And I have to admit, I love uh, data of just about any kind. Okay, so uh, the major problem uh, that, that I'm trying to address, uh, only 40% of entering college students uh, in STEM, uh, that declare STEM disciplines actually finish those degrees. Uh, and so the problem here is that the economic projections over the next decade indicate we need significantly more uh, STEM graduates than we're going to uh, graduate in that amount of time. And so we have to start figuring out ways of, of retaining these students in STEM. Uh, and so the first thing that you ask is, well, why are we losing these students? Uh, and the first one is the lack of inspiration in low-level science classes. And there's also a lot of frustration with weed-out courses. Uh, in my organic chemistry class is considered one of these weed-out courses. Uh, and so we have to figure out ways that we can uh, engage these students and keep them in the sciences. Uh, but it's generally accepted that the first two years are where we lose most of the students in STEM disciplines. Uh, so one of the reasons for this, I believe, is that STEM graduate programs, uh, like the program I attended, uh, they prepare researchers and not educators. And so in my five years at Columbia, I had exactly 
uh, one semester in front of students uh, where I was a TA uh, in charge of teaching and the rest of that time was spent doing research. <clears throat> uh, so I, I began uh, implementing a flipped classroom and I'll talk more about that in a, in a few minutes uh, back in the fall of 2011 and spring of 2012 and I was very excited when this report came out to the president, uh, the Engage to Excel report uh, that really hits on, uh, on all of these uh, factors and has really become sort of a stump issue for me. Uh, and so uh, that's sort of the background. And I thought I would just start by giving you the punchline and then we'll work our way back and I'll, and I'll tell you about exactly how uh, we've, we've been able to do this. Uh, so the first thing that we've been able to do uh, is increase enrollment in the class by 32 percent, uh, which represents uh, a significant uh, uh, increase in tuition dollars for the university, while we've simultaneously been able to actually reduce the actual class size to 96. And I'll talk more about how we did that in a couple of minutes. Um, and then if we looked at the retention rate, uh, generally if you talk to someone who teaches organic chemistry, they would tell you that a uh, about a third of the students are typically going to get a D, F, or a W. And indeed that's what I saw for a very long time teaching this course. Uh, so these are the years, the fall of 2009, 10, 11, and 12. And then I've also taught the course in the summer of 2012 and 13. And so you can see my DFW rates until uh, this past summer hovered around uh, uh, 30 to 35 percent. Um, this past fall was the first semester that we've actually engaged, uh, implemented our engaged learning activities uh, and our retention rate has gone up to 90 percent. Uh, so we're, we're now uh, seeing significant improvement in student learning and student attainment so that the students are completing the course. Uh, and there's been a lot of debate when I give presentations about this about what exactly is that attributable to. Uh, I don't have an answer for that. I just, you know, it, uh, the difference is statistically significant. Uh, and, uh, and we're, we're really happy about uh, what we've been able to do for the students. Uh, and then uh, the last thing this has been able to do and was part of my initial uh, drive to do the redesign was to reduce the amount of time that I had to spend on teaching duties. And so while I've actually increased the enrollment, uh, I've, I've decreased the amount of teaching effort it takes for me uh, to, uh, uh, to take care of those students. So that's sort of the background. Okay, so my course is designated a next-gen class, uh, and this is a program at UNT uh, that involves uh, the redesign of large enrollment classes. Uh, and so uh, it starts out with giving the students very clear expectations. Uh, these are the things that we want you to know uh, right up front. Uh, they typically uh, put a significant amount of the material online so that the students can take in that material on their own time. Uh, and then the lecture is redesigned so that students spend more time engaged in what's going on uh, and specifically working in, in small groups on experiential learning type activities. Uh, and so that's sort of the basis for uh, my redesign. Uh, the nice thing about the re uh, next gen redesign is again we're going to generate data out of this model that we can use uh, in evaluating the effectiveness. Uh, so one of the things that uh, the next gen program uh, really starts with is trying to figure out, okay, what are the core principles uh, that I want students to take away from my class? Uh, what are the essentials that every student should take away? Uh, the, uh, this becomes somewhat difficult to uh, define and uh, is somewhat subjective. Uh, it, the uh, American Chemical Society, which is the chemist trade organization, uh, the Exam Institute is working on defining these and it would be very nice if they did to have sort of a top-down approach rather than having individual faculty members sort of reinventing the wheel. Uh, but there certainly should be um, a set of core principles that every student should take away from the class. Uh, then you also have to be uh, concerned with, with differences in your students. Uh, uh, different content and expectations for different groups of students. Uh, my, my course enrolls a large number of uh, pre-med students and so the expectations for them and what they should take out of the course are going to be vastly different than if you have all chem majors. And So uh, if we can figure out what the baseline is and then design activities for those other students 
who are chemistry majors to dig deeper into the material uh, that's going to be relevant to them. Um, but it all boils down to the baseline. Uh, and then how does your course teach important lessons uh, that are beyond the scope of even your own discipline? Uh, you know, the things that employers are looking for, like critical thinking skills, teamwork, innovation. Uh, how can we incorporate that into uh, our course? Uh, that's been something I've been very interested in. Uh, and then how does uh, my course further the university's stated goals? Uh, so you have to really sort of start to think about all these things uh, when you're setting your course up and not just the discipline specific material uh, that you're in charge of covering. Uh, and then finally, you've got to, you've got to figure out how you're going to uh, assess student attainment. Uh, I'm not sure that any of this would mean anything if you don't have some way of actually uh, assessing whether or not it's been effective. Okay, so the next gen program is predicated on uh, the seamless alignment of course objectives uh, that we have now defined with instructional strategies uh, and uh, assessments. And so we've got to define those objectives very uh, uh, specifically and communicate those to the students. Uh, then we can design our instructional strategy, strategies and assessment, uh, align those with our objectives. Uh, refinement of all three of these things actually takes place uh, over the course of uh, uh, the redesign. Uh, some assessment materials, you know, I know certain questions that I like to ask students and I've been asking students don't necessarily fit within my course objectives. So I either need to go back and, and revisit my course objectives uh, or uh, think about changing the assessment. Uh, but ideally, uh, there's nothing in any one of these three pieces that doesn't fit with the other two. Uh, <clears throat> the nice thing about this uh, strategy is if students are not attaining it, whatever uh, learning objective you have, you can uh, pinpoint it very quickly and then go back and either redesign your instructional strategies uh, or uh, adjust your assessment. Okay, so the course objectives, and this, is, this was for my uh, uh, first semester organic course. I teach the two semester sequence. Uh, and so I came up with, with what I thought were a list of uh, 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 fairly comprehensive way of looking at the first semester of organic chemistry. Uh, and so uh, these are, are very broad and, and you can't write a test question that's going to uh, uh, specifically probe a student's understanding of these. And they're, they're intended to be very broad. Uh, but this forms the, the core of knowledge that I hope to communicate uh, to the students. <clears throat> uh, and then I have to ask myself what the content that I'm using, uh, if it doesn't communicate one of these things, uh, should I really even be covering it at all? And uh, textbooks, uh, they contain a, a huge amount of uh, what I would argue is superfluous information for most students. Uh, and it can actually be uh, extremely distracting to them. And so uh, I've been trying to figure out how to distill down uh, to the core of what it is I want them to know and then take out any extraneous detail. Um, uh, and then once the core is in place, now we can go back and start building on that to challenge uh, sort of the top 10% of the class. Uh, but just like in research, we need a baseline or somewhere to start. Okay, so once the course goals have been written, uh, we write you know, global learning outcomes uh, so that if they master each of the global learning outcomes, and those are the GLOs here, if each one of these uh, are attained, then that should be sufficient for the student to obtain whatever the goal uh, that you've set. Uh, and again, these are still broad and can't be uh, directly assessed. And then under each of the global learning outcomes, a very specific learning outcome, an SLO, is written. Uh, and these are at the level that they can be assessed uh, just with uh, uh, test items. Uh, and you write enough of these for a given uh, a global learning outcome that you can, uh, if they can achieve or attain uh, the specific learning outcomes it extrapolates to the global learning outcome, which extrapolates up to the goal level. Um, and again, you know, these are uh, uh, somewhat fluid in nature. You go into the course with a set of these, and that may change slightly over time. Um, but I think the refinement uh, is, is good. Okay, so when I started my redesign, I think you know, there was an article in Nature Chemistry back in 2009 uh, from Jeff Moore at UIUC 
that really started my interest in the redesign. Uh, and he had a course that they had uh, converted completely to an online class. And so <clears throat> uh, there was no face-to-face -face time uh, for the class. Uh, and at that time, Flip Classroom was, was still pretty novel. Uh, MOOCs uh, hadn't, uh, hadn't debuted yet. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, and so things have changed a lot over the last four years with MOOCs, the Khan Academy. Um, you can certainly find lots of chemists that have flipped the classroom. Uh, but the question that I think is uh, the most important is how do we uh, take this technology and use it to best educate the students? And so the MOOCs, I think one of the things that, things that you lose in the massive open enrollment classes is that there's no human element there. And so if you do away with all the class time, then uh, students, uh, they don't tend to persist uh, through the course. Uh, and uh, lots of publishers have now come on board uh, with lots of this material. Uh, there are podcasts that are available from Wiley, which is the book that I use, along with some really great uh, software programs that uh, help students master the material and give them lots of feedback. Uh, and so there's, there's lots of exciting things. There are lots of exciting things happening with technology. Uh, and we're trying to figure out how to best use those. OK, so my classroom, I, I didn't simply uh, record my uh, lectures in class. Uh, I actually made these podcasts, and I won't inflict this on you. Uh, but basically, uh, you've got the, the video of me in the bottom corner. Uh, these, these are done on a smart board so I can write on the screen. I can uh, include web content and just do a screen capture of all of it while I'm making the podcast. And so I did these covering the entire year of organic chemistry. Uh, it came out to about uh, 23 hours. Each one of these uh, covers a very specific top, uh, very, a very specific topic. Uh, and the students' response has been overwhelmingly positive to these because they can pause, take notes, rewind. Uh, the lectures are available anytime. Uh, and the way the course is set up is I assign a set of these podcasts for them to watch before they come to class on a given day. Uh, these are all posted on UNT's iTunes U site. Uh, and so students that are enrolled in the course, they use their university login information, and they log in, and they can see these lists of podcasts. And so again, I would just uh, assign a set of these for them to watch. Um, I tried to keep them under eight minutes just to keep uh, the, the students' attention. Uh, some topics, that's not possible. But for the most part, they're less than 10 minutes. Uh, and so once this was complete, then the question became, uh, what do I do with in-class time? Uh, and there, there were two things I was interested in to begin with. One was incorporating STEM incentive activities. Uh, and again, this is sort of my stump issue. And then the other was working on the students' problem-solving skills. Uh, I feel that a lot of the students, uh, they just don't see enough work problems. They don't spend enough time working them themselves. And that can be a major stumbling block for the students. Uh, so one of the first things that I did was incorporate the STEM incentives. Uh, and this was designed to increase student interest in STEM disciplines and the course overall. Uh, and this was part of UNT's transformative instruction initi initiative. Uh, and the activity that I'm showing here is uh, this was on the globalization of scientific research. And so I took the first uh, 20 articles out of the first uh, uh, issue of uh, the Journal of the American Chemical Society in the years indicated. Uh, the blue represents articles where all, all the authors' uh, home institutions are just U.S. And so you can see from 1982 to 2012, uh, there's been a significant uh, uh, international component to uh, research that's being published in that journal. And so I, I tried to take some time to highlight <clears throat> to highlight the STEM workforce uh, issue on the first day of class. Uh, instead of just going over the syllabus, I actually uh, walked them through uh, careers in chemistry, uh, what they pay by the different job types, uh, overview of graduate school, uh, you know, including stipends, admission requirements, what to expect. And I, I tell them all about what my classmates from both my undergraduate at uh, UNT and the graduate program in Columbia, what those students are up to now. They all have uh, very interesting jobs. 
Uh, but this this uh, received overwhelmingly positive feedback from the students, and I even had one student request uh, the slides that I use for this uh, because he recruits at local K through 12 schools uh, for STEM majors, uh, and I think hundreds of of those kids have seen these presentations at this point. Um, but this format, the flipped classroom, provides the time for these kinds of activities uh, as well as others. And initially, I was still lecturing uh, a small amount, but spent most of the time uh, working on the students' problem-solving skills. Um, much to my dismay, uh, even though I was up in front of the group working problems, it really consisted of uh, me standing up there working problems in front of a group of uh, bleary-eyed students. Uh, and so uh, I didn't particularly want to stand there if, if I felt like they weren't getting anything out of it either. Uh, so that led me to look for uh, some uh, techniques that I could incorporate into the classroom uh, that would help engage the students. Uh, and it turns out it's not an issue of whether or not we know what engages the students and what helps them learn better. Uh, it's really an issue of not enough faculty are actually incorporating these things, these activities, into their teaching. Uh, it's still uh, predominantly a, a PowerPoint lecture format uh, uh, that's not engaged with the students. Uh, but there are, are many widely accepted ways to do this. Uh, uh, not all the methods are amenable to all teaching styles. Not all these things I would be comfortable doing. Uh, but I think pretty much anyone can find at least one off this list uh, that they would be comfortable incorporating in their, their uh, uh, classroom. Uh, I personally chose the small group peer instruction uh, activity. And that was based on my experience as an undergraduate when I was taking these courses and uh, the chem majors all got together and we worked through lots of problems uh, and that's how we, we mastered the material and so I thought this would be a good uh, format for the course. Uh, and so I said I have 192 students uh, but I've reduced the class size to 96. Uh, so we have a total of four hours per week of uh, class time, uh, the three hours of lecture plus one hour of recitation. Uh, I basically have two groups of 96 that each meet two hours a week. Uh, and so in that respect, it's a 50% online uh, class. Uh, and then of each of the two 96 student sections, I break those into 16 groups of six. Uh, and each one sits at one of these tables uh, where they work on uh, the, group, the group assignments. Uh, so they work on a new problem set every class day. And it's uh, these problem sets. Uh, account for 40% of their grade. Uh, so while they work on them together, they're all individually responsible for uploading their answers later. Uh, and I'll talk more about that in a couple of minutes. Uh, and it didn't work out perfectly the first semester. Uh, I uh, had a lot of students that would uh, be absent, and the others were unwilling to uh, uh, take attendance. Uh, they were basically giving each other passes, and so I've actually had to uh, require attendance and they also had a problem with the participation level. I, I would notice uh, uh, small numbers of students doing most of the work, uh, and I really feel like it should be a, a group effort and, and all the students need to be engaged. So uh, this semester I instituted a peer evaluation uh, where they get to evaluate their peers' performance, and that accounts for 15% of their grade. Uh, and so if they're absent that day, they get a zero for the assignment. Um, and then at the end, they're going to evaluate uh, each other's uh, performance. And so basically, my job is to patrol the room. Uh, I also have a TA and a supplement instructor. Uh, and we uh, answer questions. Uh, I end up giving lots of, of mini lectures. Uh, and, and so I had a TA ask me, you know, I've had a number of different groups ask me this same question, should we stop the class? And, and just answer it all at once. Uh, and, and I thought about that and decided against it uh, because one of the things I hadn't anticipated is that you know students are actively listening uh, when, when they're working on a problem, you walk up and give a mini lecture, they're actually uh, absorbing the content at that point. Whereas if you stop everyone and they're not working on it, then those students that aren't working on it are gonna, uh, they're gonna miss out on a, a lot of what's uh, being communicated. Uh, so that was a really nice aspect that, that I didn't expect. Uh, in terms of uh, the assignments, 
uh, that they work on in class, and these are just typical multiple choice assignments. I can make these a little more difficult. I can have multiple correct answers. Uh, I can do fill in the blank matching. Uh, there are lots of possibilities, um, but it's a, you know a standard problem set to give them some more experience uh, with the material. Uh, so the redesign up to this point, uh, I at the end of the two semester sequence, uh, we give an American Chemical Society standardized exam uh, that covers both semesters of organic. Uh, and, we, and we've been given the same exam uh, since 2011. Uh, and you can see the green, uh, that's the number of students scoring at or above the national average. And this is just for my section, uh, my sections of organic. Uh, and so in 2011-2012 uh, academic year, I introduced the podcast. I uh, saw a little bit of uh, uh, improvement, uh, but I was still lecturing predominantly in class. Uh, that went all the way through. Uh, until last year was when I completely eliminated uh, the lectures in class and uh, student performances continued to increase. And in fact, the highest scoring group was the one from last summer, which was a surprise to me. Uh, we basically doubled the number of students scoring uh, at or above the national average on, on this exam. Uh, and it's a 70 question final exam. It's a, it's a pretty tough uh, test. Okay, but this, so this is just one assessment, uh, and it's a, a summative assessment. Uh, it would be very nice if we had more data, uh, especially formative data, that we could actually uh, do something about the course. Uh, and this is what I've been using ExamSoft for. Uh, so with ExamSoft, uh, you can write a question uh, in the program. Uh, you can enter the categories from uh, your student learning objectives. And you can tag each question with a particular uh, student learning objective. Uh, and so I've been administering uh, the homework assignments as well as the tests, uh, except for the final exam through ExamSoft. Uh, and I think I have about 600 plus questions at this point. Uh, and so we're generating uh, large amounts of data uh, at this point. Um, so the students take the tests uh, in UNT's uh, computer testing facility, so this is all done online. Uh, I know before I even leave the, uh, the testing center how the students have done on the test. Uh, and so it's, it's really nice to have that real-time information. Uh, and as a matter of fact, last fall I had uh, a test, uh, test three, where the student average was about a 50. Uh, and I knew this before I even left the testing facility. Uh, and so I immediately knew I had to assign new material I knew what topics it needed to cover, uh, and so I assigned that and then gave them an opportunity to take a different version but covering basically the same material, and the average improved on uh, when they retook it uh, to about a 70. And so I was able to intervene and, uh, and improve uh, student learning at that point. Uh, there's lots of other data that's available, uh, and I have really just started using the longitudinal analysis. Um, but this allows you to look over uh, the entire course. At the end of the course, you can do a longitudinal analysis, and it'll give you uh, the student performance on uh, all of your objectives uh, that you had test items for. And so there's a huge amount of data here. Uh, the, the longitudinal analysis is required by the NextGen program because uh, they want to know how well did your students obtain uh, your objectives. Uh, and this would also be useful for accrediting bodies, department chairs, deans, uh, uh, and those types of people. Okay, so here is uh, the aggregate data from my class last fall. And this is just for uh, learning objective number one. Uh, so you can see I had a total of 66 items on 11 different assessments. And that's just the first learning objective. So with uh, ACS final, I was getting 70 questions at the end. Uh, here I've got 66 on just this one uh, learning objective. And uh, you can look through the column on the right and see how the, the, the group performed. And if you look all the way down at the bottom, you see 1.3.3. Uh, students didn't master that topic very well. Uh, and it turns out that's actually a difficult topic uh, historically for students in organic. Uh, and so I'm not surprised, but I would like to pinpoint the areas that do need improvement uh, and spend some effort on uh, redesigning uh, to help them achieve uh, better results. 
Uh, you can also uh, monitor performance over time. So if I want to look and I just ran uh, this report uh, on this semester where I took the first half of the semester, uh, did a longitudinal analysis, and then did the same thing on the second half. Uh, and I looked at for the objectives. These were the eight objectives that were covered in both halves of the semester. And I can see uh, from the first half of the semester, uh, in all but one of these, uh, student attainment has improved. Uh, in the one where they didn't, uh, I actually went back and looked at the questions and by item analysis, one of them looked like it was poorly written, uh, didn't have a good discrimination index, and so that uh, based on that and the fact that there are only uh, two items there is uh, 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 maybe an anomaly. But certainly the uh, objectives where you have numbers of items written, uh, you can be confident that your students are, uh, have mastered more of that material uh, over the course of the semester. Uh, so that's, that's exciting. In terms of what the students get out of this, uh, uh, using ExamSoft, uh, so this is a typical report a student would get after they took an exam in the testing center. I would release the report to them, uh, and they don't ever see the test questions again, uh, which is really nice from my perspective because I don't have to write any new ones, uh, but they do get a report on uh, how well they mastered each one of the learning objectives. Uh, and so if a student is not performing uh, in a particular area, it's clearly identified. Uh, I haven't done this yet, but these learning objectives can be tied uh, to the individual podcast, and so they could have uh, an assessment feedback loop and, and be directed to exactly the point where they need to go back and watch uh, this particular podcast. Uh, so that's really great information for them. Uh, here's an example of a student that's a B student, uh, that if you look at their report, the one objective they didn't uh, get the green triangle on was the first one, uh, where they got six out of eight questions. And so this is a, a student that, you know, maybe if they go back and look at this one particular thing, uh, that gets them over the hump and uh, to, to become an A student. Uh, so I think the students can really get some valuable uh, information out of this in real time. All right, so what I've learned from my redesign. Uh, so more students uh, can certainly be reached through engaged learning environments, and it's uh, unbelievable to me how different my class is now from uh, before. Uh, we can use real-time analysis of student attainment data uh, to improve performance. Uh, it's really important that you set the expectations for your students if you undertake uh, one of these major redesigns, uh, even uh, from the prospect of you need to tell them this is why it's redesigned, because it's been shown that you will learn better in this format. Uh, I didn't tell my students that last fall, and my student evaluations actually went down um, uh, because the students uh, felt like they weren't expecting uh, the course format to be the way it was and didn't understand why it had been set up that way. Uh, but they had performed better, and their evaluations were worse. Uh, but that's not, that's not a problem. Uh, so participation, if you're doing the small group activities, that's got to be part of the grade uh, or, the, or the students won't do it. Uh, I did find that groups of all male or all female, uh, they, they appeared to be less engaged and they were, uh, they seemed to be more uh, socially engaged than, than engaged in working on a particular activity. Uh, ideally, I think you assign roles to each member of the group and then rotate those roles over the course of the semester so that each student uh, plays a particular role. Uh, so next on the horizon, uh, we have, uh, uh, I'm really excited, my students are about to take the final exam this semester. I'm hoping they exceed the national average, uh, but I've got half of them taking the same exam from before. Uh, the other half are going to take a new online version that the ACS is, is piloting, uh, and, and it would be nice to have those two uh, uh, different assessments agree. Uh, and then we're working to develop learning objectives uh, for adoption by all three sections being taught by different faculty members here. Uh, and then what we'd like to do is administer a pre and a post test uh, and see uh, how this course format uh, affects student performance. So we're really excited about that. hope to start that next year. And with that, I'd like to thank the, the people involved, uh, Ron, my TA, uh, and 
uh, uh, Brett at Clear, and Beverly from ExamSoft, and Nancy, Ron, and Mike uh, from Clear. Those guys have been a tremendous help, uh, and I'd like to thank you guys for joining me in this webinar. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much, Rob. Really appreciate it. It was a great presentation. Um, again, if anybody is interested in posing a question to Dr. Petros, now is a really great time to go ahead and take the opportunity to type a question into the questions area of the GoToWebinar control panel, which should be on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, we've got a little bit of time to take some questions, so we're going to go ahead and go through those now. Looks like we already have a few um, available, so I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. Uh, okay. Rob, the, the first question uh, that we have are, uh, or is, what additional course changes are you anticipating making in the future? Are there any other uh, uh, tech implementations you're hoping to, to make? Uh, I think we've incorporated about as much technology as we as we can, and you know when they go and sit in these groups, you know most of the tables have six students with six computers sitting at the table, and uh, and so they're it's pretty tech heavy. Uh, I would like to see some more of the uh, other activities being incorporated, things that uh, that enhance um, you know problem solving skills, leadership, uh, and teamwork, uh, and continue to build on those on, on those aspects. Uh, of the course. Great, thanks so much. Uh, next question is, how easy or difficult was it for you to transition to electronic testing? Uh, it wasn't all that difficult for me. Um, the students, uh, they prefer electronic testing because it, uh, it, it releases a score to them immediately. Uh, I really like it because I don't have to grade anything, uh, and I don't have to wait for a TA to grade it. And so, you know, they go, they take, they take the test, they find out, I find out, and and from my perspective, this is the the best way to go. Especially if you factor in that you don't, if you don't release the questions again, you don't have to write additional test problems. Great, thank you. Next question is, do I understand correctly that you do not design the final exam, that it is instead from an outside source? That is correct. It is from the American Chemical Society Exam Institute. Uh, Follow-up question, Rob, are all of the questions from that source, or are you able to write your own questions and add those in if you wanted to? Uh, no, we, we stick with the 70 questions. Uh, the reason that we do that, they, they publish the national norms for uh, students across the country. And so what we want to be able to do is gauge how our students perform versus uh, students nationwide. And, and I like to be able to communicate that to the student because they're going to take, you know, the MCAT or, or whatever test that they're going to take, and this will give them some idea of where they should fit in in terms of the national average. Okay, another follow-up question. Um, do you build your own assessments in ExamSoft ever? Uh, the ExamSoft assessments, I build all of those. And it's no uh, no different than, than building an assessment in Blackboard or, or any other computer program. It's, uh, it takes some time initially, but again, once they're in there, uh, I've got over 600 questions now in, in ExamSoft. Great, thank you. Next question is, um, how are your learning object objectives determined? Uh, this is something where, you know, in, I, I would like to see uh, something from the top. You know, I'd love to see the American Chemical Society. Here are the things that students should know. But since they don't do that, uh, you know, I have to sit down and really reflect on what I think is important, uh, the, the core competency that every student should have mastered. Uh, and I really try to distill it down to that point. If you ask someone else if they agree with my learning objectives, the answer is probably going to be no. And if you get three people in the room, I would be surprised if three of them could agree. Um, and, and so that's it's sort of a subjective process, uh, but you have to make a good faith effort to try to figure out what's best for the student. Hey, this is somewhat of a follow-up to that last question as well. Do you add the learning object objectives as as you go, or are they predetermined by your course objectives or program objectives? 
uh, all the objectives were written for this course before the class started last fall. Uh, and so I went in with a set that were written. And, and like I said, it, it is refining over time as I start to see how the objectives don't quite line up with what I believe is the, uh, uh, the assessment piece uh, or certain questions that the student should be able to answer. And so I have to revisit that and figure out, okay, how do I make that part of the objective? And so you do have this refinement of those. But I went into, the, into this year with a complete set. Okay, great. Next question is, is your assessment, are your assessments consisting of only multiple choice questions? I do have some uh, matching and fill in the blank, but it's predominantly uh, multiple choice. Okay, next question is, have you ever decided halfway through the semester to change up the group membership in the 16 groups? This might be important if certain groups are not working well together. I am actually learning a lot about small group work uh, right now, and that's uh, I uh, I have noticed that some groups perform better than others, and and that's one of the things that uh, a number of people have suggested to me is just to change them up, and uh, so I will probably end up doing that and assigning the different roles. You know, have one student every class that's assigned to name all the molecules, uh, and then just rotate that job around uh, over the course of the semester. And so I think the small group work, the dynamic, there's, there's a lot there that we probably still uh, will be working on. Great, thanks. Next question is, how are your items and exam soft validated beyond item analysis after the exam? Uh, that is the, so, so I write the test questions uh, following the best practices for writing multiple choice test items and I make sure that they line up with uh, the, the course objectives uh, and so that's the only validity evidence I have going in is that I follow all the rules and they're aligned with the content. Okay, 